I thank you for your presence today and for being here and sharing in this time. You should have a bulletin and you can follow the outline that is there and uh, that you can see what we are speaking of, talking about this particular day, how to enter God's family, and I also refer to this as stories of three mothers, three mothers and their conversion experience. Now, I'm going to ask you to turn to two passages today, one in the Old Testament, one in the New. So if you would first of all look at Ruth chapter 4 and the last several verses in verse 14 through verse 22. Luke, or excuse me, Ruth chapter 4 verse 14. Let me read these verses to you. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher, a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Amenadab. Amenadab begot Nishon, and Nishon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz, Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. Jesse begot David. Years ago, a man, and you're probably familiar with this, this particular man took his family tree and he did an unusual thing with the names. Now had he taken the names and listed them in just a one page pamphlet he couldn't have given the pamphlet away instead what the man did was is that he took the names and behind each name is that there was a story just as in your life that there is a story there is a story that this particular man did with each of the names and we know that over 40 years ago that Alex Haley made a fortune as many watch that particular TV series that we know to be Roots. The latter part of the scripture reads like a dictionary, the, the scripture that we read just a few moments ago. There's a lot of interesting words, a lot of interesting names, but not much of a plot. The last verses of Ruth confront us with another list of names that are given here in the Old Testament. And this is one of the shorter list of names in the Old Testament. We know that there are many longer genealogies that are found in the Old Testament. Now, in your Bible reading, have you ever come to these names and you've skipped over them in your Bible reading? Now be honest, you're in church, all right. Okay. I think we all have it one time or another. For example, in the book of 1 Chronicles, there is nine chapters and 407 verses. And in that passage, you find just little, just name after name after name. And for the most part, I think we would say to read these lists of names is rather dull, monotonous, and a boring experience. But as you read these, I think God blesses our per perseverance. God blesses our per persistence. Well, let me just whet your appetite to see if I can get you interested in these names at the end of Ruth. Turn, if you would, then to Matthew chapter 1, the very first chapter in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, and let me begin reading there in verse 3, and see if these names ring a bell to you. Matthew 1, verse 3, the Bible says, Judah begot Perez, and 
Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Amenadab, Amenadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. Now you look at that list given by Matthew, there's a few slight differences in spelling, but the list is almost identical to the list that we find there at the end of Ruth chapter 4. Are you interested? Well, look at Ruth, look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Matthew 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now hopefully that makes it a little more interesting because we should always be interested in Jesus Christ because it is the family tree of Jesus Christ. And as Alex Haley did years ago, it's what you do with a family tree and what we do with the family tree of Jesus Christ. With this family, we notice that this family tree ties the New Testament and the Old Testament together. Matthew says the historical record, the book of generations of Jesus Christ. And where the Old Testament is the book of generations about Adam, the New Testament is the historical record of Jesus Christ. Every human being in the world is in one of these two families. By natural birth, men and women are in Adam. Adam, that represents that of death. By the new birth, though, you are in the family of Jesus Christ, and your future is eternal life. Further investigation also reveals that Jesus Christ is the only one who can prove his right to be the Messiah, to be the anointed one. When you come to the New Testament, you find that there are two genealogical records in the New Testament. Matthew, Matthew's gospel, is Jewish in nature, and he traces his genealogy back to Abraham. But when we come to the gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 3, Luke's gospel is Gentile in nature, and he traces it all the way back to Adam. By the way, there's another matter of interest in the Bible tree, in the family tree of Jesus, that is unique proof of the virgin birth. If you have your Bible over there in Matthew 1, look down to verse 16. Verse 16 says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom, you might circle that pronoun there, was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. The pronoun whom is feminine. The reference is not to Joseph, but is to Mary, and Christ was born not of Joseph, but of Mary. And all of the begats of history could never have produced the Son of God. He was the only begotten Son of God, conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. Now somebody says, well, why, why is all of that important? Well, if Jesus was not virgin born, then he was tainted with sin, and he could not be our Savior. You may ask again, well, what does all of this have to do about how I get into the family of God? Well, go back and look again at Matthew chapter 1 and verses 3 through 6. It's the identical family line that you find there in Ruth chapter 4 with a significant addition. And Matthew's genealogy, he mentions five women. And the five women are Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in Ruth, it's Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. Now in Ruth, we know that she is the star. And yet the passage we read a few moments ago from Ruth chapter 4, verses 14 through 22, when her book closes, that Ruth's name is not even mentioned in the genealogy. Well, this was normal procedure. 
Why then does the Bible then insert the names of three women? Well, this is Mother's Day. These are ladies, and, and, and I want to show you that in the listing of these three women, that we learn how to enter the family of God. And I've given to these two, you just better just listen, there are one, two, and three there in your bulletin. Consider each of these if you would. First of all, we think about Tamar, how she got into the family of God. She got in because she was a sinner. Ruth chapter 4, verse 18, makes reference to her. The family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Ezra. Matthew chapter 1, verse 3, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, to be honest, that's the only thing we know about Tamar. Her story is found in Genesis chapter 38. And I'm not going to read that particular story. And to be honest, I find it hard to read that chapter in a public service. I mean, if you ever would want to find a Hollywood script that is full of scandal, then just read Genesis chapter 38. I'm not going to go into all of this, but remember that Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. Get this, she had two sons, twin boys, by her father-in-law, Judah. Oh, she dressed up uh, as a prostitute, and Judah came and made his advances, made his, and they were together. It's, it's a lurid story. But listen, like all of us, Tamar is a sinner. That's the only basis for her inclusion in the family tree of Jesus Christ. Now her story reminds us about two things. Number one is her story reminds us about men's problem. Some would say today that the greatest problem that our nation, that the world faces today is our physical health. They'd say that the greatest problem, yes, is COVID-19. How we're going to find a virus? What is the quarantine going to end? When are all things going to open up? And when can we be back to normal as it was? Some will say, well, the greatest problem that we have right now is the economic uncertainty that we have this 14 or 14 percent, almost 15 percent of people in our nation that are now unemployed and, and people are wondering what they're going to do, how they're going to pay their bills, how they're going to have groceries, how they're going to be able to provide. And yes, these are great problems. But we are reminded that our basic problem is a sin problem. That we are sinners in need of a Savior. The first contact between my soul and God is not my goodness, it is my badness. Men are sinners. Women are sinners. We need a Savior. Tamar needed a Savior. Every person, every boy needs a Savior, but men and women are reluctant to part from their sins. You might have heard about little Johnny. Little Johnny was five years old. Little Johnny had been out playing like all little five-year-old boys do. Little Johnny was dirty. By the way, Youngest son's FaceTimes the other night. He says, Look at two of your grandsons. And they were in the mud with the dogs. They left the water on. And then that's just a whole other story. I'm sure that they got hosed down. But look, Johnny was dirty. Hmm. Johnny's mama said, Johnny, you need to take a bath. Johnny didn't like soap and water, so he began to protest. Johnny's mama said, Johnny, don't you want to be clean? Johnny said, yes, Mom, but he said, can't you just dust me off? Well, I think a lot of people are like that. They just want to be dusted off. They don't want to give up their sins. Tamar reminds us, not only reminds us about our problem, but her, her story also tells us about God's provision. Christ Jesus stepped out of glory, humbling himself, 
and didn't stop until he came to a smelly stable. That the infinite became finite. That the almighty consented to become weak. That he that upheld all things by the power of his word spoke the cosmos into existence willingly became helpless like a baby. And when he came as a man in his eternal form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, that of death on a cross. We need the provision that God has made for us in Jesus Christ. Several years ago, one of our dry cleaning stores, during the time of Thanksgiving and Christmas, just put up for the little ad. Their ad was is that we remove holiday stains. Well, I stand here today to tell you that there is one who can and will remove all stains. And his name is Jesus Christ. And the ingredient he uses is his blood. You come to him and he will cleanse you with his rich, royal, precious blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how you enter the family of God. That you can enter because you are a sinner. And the way is open only to sinners. And this is Tamar. Tamar got into the family of God because she was a sinner. The second woman and mother is one that we know to be that of Rahab. Rahab got in because she was a believer. At the end of Ruth, the Bible says, Salon, the father of Boaz. Matthew chapter 1 verse 5 says, Salon fathered Boaz by Rahab. In fact, to be perfectly blunt, Rahab was a harlot. She was a prostitute in one of the most depraved cities in the history of the world known as Jericho. But how did Rahab become part of the family of God? Well, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, and the chapter that we know to be called of God's Hall of Fame of Faith, Rahab's name is listed along with others. And Hebrews 11, 31 says, By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Rahab reminds us that the gospel, that the good news is about something to hear. Now let's go back to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 2 records the story of Rahab. Here is Israel. Here is Joshua leading the Israelites. Israel was getting ready to invade the city of Jericho. Spies were sent out ahead to, to spy out the land and spy out the city of Jericho. And we know that the spies, that they came to the house of Rahab, the prostitute. Rahab hid the spies from those who were searching for them. And after Rahab brought the spies out of hiding, she said this. Now listen to what she said. She said to the spies, I know who you are. We've heard what your God did at the Red Sea. We've heard how your God opened the Red Sea and let you pass over on dry ground. Now folks, that happened 40 years before. 40 years before God had done that, Rahab had heard about it. By the way, there are many reasons why God let the children of Israel wander in the wilderness for 40 years. I think one of those reasons is, is that he gave the city of Jericho 40 years to repent, to turn their heart back to God. How long has God given many today to turn from their sin? How long has God given to you? How long of time have men and women had to give their life to Jesus Christ? How many years has God permitted you to live that you might have an opportunity to hear the gospel, to hear the good news? Well, Rahab heard a message. The gospel, the good news, is something you hear. Rahab heard what God did at the Red Sea. 
How God had opened up the Red Sea and the Israelites had marched out on dry ground. The gospel is what God did through His Son, Jesus Christ. And the most humble mind on the earth can comprehend and, and understand it. Rahab didn't have good works. She didn't have a good life to offer to God. Rahab had taken the body that God had given her intended to be His temple. And she had sold it on the streets for years. And there was only one thing that she could do. She could hear the message, the good news. Well, the story is not only about something to hear, but her story is about something to believe. Rahab was a believer. The word believe literally means to commit. And so Rahab said, I heard it, I believe it. Your God is is God. She was willing to make a commitment. It wasn't about her good works because she had none. It wasn't about her good life. She had lived one. The spies told her to put a, a scarlet thread. How about that? Red symbolizing that of the blood of Jesus Christ. To put that scarlet thread out her window. And when the Israelites marched around the city of Jericho, the walls of Jericho, they would spare Rahab and her household. She believed. She committed herself to it. A picture of God's wonderful grace. God takes a harlot and makes her a heroine in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11. She is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 and also in James chapter 2. Hebrews 11.31, James 2.25 indicate that Rahab had put her faith in God before the spies ever arrived in Jericho. You enter God's family when you commit your life to Him. You enter by faith and trust in Him. Tamar got into the family of God. She was a sinner. Rahab got in. She was a believer. Tamar got in. She was a sinner. That's where God starts with all of us. Rahab committed her life to the message she had heard. But there's one more. One more lady. One more mother. Her name is Ruth. Ruth got in because she was a receiver. Someone did something kind for Ruth. Now, to be honest, as we look at it, and as we read the story of Ruth, Ruth was a good person. She, she's not in the category of a, of a Tamar and a Rahab. They were prostitutes. Ruth wasn't. <coughs> I read her story again and, you, and you'll not find not, not one negative statement said about Ruth. In fact, it was said in Ruth chapter 3 verse 11 as Boaz says that all of this town knows that you are a <coughs> virtuous woman. Nothing is said about her. But did she get into the family of God because of her goodness? No. You see, the law of God excludes us. Let's remember, let's go back and remember that uh, Ruth had a problem. Ruth was from Moab. And the law said that no Moabite could become part of the family of Israel down to the 10th generation. So the law excluded Ruth. Her goodness could not get her in. Although there was nothing said negative about Ruth, we know that she was a sinner. And in spite of all of her goodness, Ruth was still a sinner. But just for the sake of argument, Let's, let's assume. Let, let's just assume that there was nothing bad on her record. 
Let, let, let's assume Ruth. She, she never did a wrong thing. She never had a bad thought. Does this mean that Ruth could get into the family of God? No. Why? Well, the holy law of God excluded her. She was born wrong. Goodness is relative. Well, the question is, goodness compared to what? Well, let's just suppose that uh, you keep every law on the books of this city except one. Let's say that you go down here to one of these Cephalo stores and you rob a Cephalo store. Now, as you stand before the judge, you say to the judge, Sir, I know I've stolen. No doubt about it. But I want you to know that I have never ever run a red light in this town. I have paid my taxes on time. I never killed anybody. Now I, I know I robbed a store. But I want you to look at all of these good things that I've done. And because of these good things, Judge, I want you to excuse me for this one bad thing I've done in robbing a store. Oh, I have a feeling the Judge would probably have a smirk on his face. And the Judge would say, if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. You broke the law. You are guilty. You see, friend, without the Lord Jesus Christ, all of us are just good enough to go to hell. The law of God excludes us. The law is not a 99.9% .9 Proposition, it is 100%. The law says do this and live. Break the law at any point and you are a lawbreaker and you need a savior. If the law excluded Ruth, well then how did she get into the family of God? She got in because she was a receiver. The grace of God includes us. The law excluded Ruth. But praise God, grace included her. We know the story. One day a man named Boaz came. Ruth was a poor outcast girl from Moab. Boaz one day saw Ruth gleaning in his field and, and he fell deeply in love with Ruth. Boaz paid the price for her redemption and, and brought her into his family. By marriage, she became part of his family. Ruth is famous because grace, kindness included what the law excluded. Dear friend, there's not a person in heaven there or on any other basis. Not one sinner will be strutting in, in heaven saying, well, I did it my way. I got it because I did it my way. Not one. But instead, there will be multitudes in heaven singing. I've been redeemed by grace divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to Him I now resign. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. Dear friend, if you will come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be famous in eternity. Hear what the Bible says, what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, so that in the coming ages God might display, God might show you off the immeasurable, immeasurable riches of His grace in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Lord will point to you one day and say, Do you see that poor, lost, <coughs> hell deserving outcast sinner? He is in heaven. She is in heaven.
They are in my family. Because he was a sinner. She was a believer. She was a receiver. And dear friend, that's how you live. The family of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this day. We thank you for your message of hope, of love, and grace. Hearing the testimony of three women, three mothers who are part of your family. Testifying today that for those who do not know you, they come to know Jesus Christ also as their Savior and Lord. Father, that each one will recognize, Lord, that we all have a problem, that there is a sin problem, but that you have made provision through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the message of hope and the message of the good news and of the gospel that we hear. Thank you, Father, that your message is one to be received. Father, nothing to achieve, nothing that we could ever do to gain the righteousness of Christ, but all that was done by the cross of Jesus Christ, and by the power of the cross, the power of his resurrection. We ask your Lord for you to take this time today, Lord, your blessings upon this time of invitation, Lord, for those who need to know you for decisions that need to be made for Christ today. Oh, Lord God, we would ask, Father, your will be done, and your spirit, oh Lord, will be dead. So we ask your blessings upon this time, and all to the glory of your name. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We do offer a time of invitation this morning. It is a time that we will sing together just as I am without one plea. That thy blood was shed for thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. We can't come in contact with one another, can we? So how do we do this? Well, you can indicate if you would like to come sit here on the front row, and I'll visit with you shortly after our time together. Or maybe it would be that there on the back side of that bulletin, on the back, back page, is our numbers. You can text or call me today, letting me know of your decision. Christ. Whatever it would be, you can do so and do so right now. So let's stand together, if we would please. And let's sing together as Brother Mark leads us in this time. This wonderful song that we sing together that we know by heart. Let's sing if we would. God speaks to you. God moves upon you. That you can do as God will be. And you will be Lord, please, please. <laughs> Jesus, 
that you may be with one mind and one mouth glorified the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may be seated. 